is um, for class 7 of ME 470 and we are now entering into chapter 14 in dealing with uh, gear stress. Um, this class we're going to deal with the non-agma bending fatigue. In the next class, that will be class 8, we're going to deal with non-agma contact or wear, um, contact stresses or contact fatigue aka wear. And then in class uh, 9, we're going to deal with the AGMA uh, equations and um, there's a lot of material so let's um, try to keep organized here. Um, so the failure modes that we generally have in gears can be broken down into two categories, either bending, stress, fatigue, or contact stress and that we call wear. And there's two methods to deal with um, the, uh, th there's, there's two approaches here. We have the non-AGMA and the AGMA. And AGMA, by the way, stands for the American Gear Manufacturers Association, and they set a lot of standards, f uh, um, and they also come up with a procedure for um, uh, evaluating uh, the power capacity. And that's usually what we're looking at here. We're looking at a power capacity. Um, either we're given a power and we're asked for the stress, or we're given a, a strength and we're set to uh, establish how much power can be handled um, by the gears. Um, so typically we will do um, four analyses um, in, in things. We'll deal with um, both the wear, bending and the wear in the pinion and the gear. And they'll be slightly different. Um, there's different factors. And there's a lot of factors to consider here. So there's bunches and bunches of things to look through. So it's our job to try to keep this organized as best that we can. So. Um, here's a brief look at some pictures of some broken gears due to bending. And you just think of that as being, you know, just regular old stress being placed in there. Um, the other is due to contact stress, which is a localized and it's due to do the, do the contact stress that we covered in ME370. Um, and actually this whole topic is a really good um, uh, reflection on what we learned in 370 and trying to apply it. So you can see that we could have like cracks in tooth, teeth that are initiated or, or a, to, a part of the to, tooth can chip off and, and there's also going to be due to uh, fatigue, right? So the thing can be overstressed just by putting a, putting a whole lot of load onto the thing. But most of the time uh, what we're going to look at is something that breaks over time due to fatigue. And like we remember from ME370, fatigue a failure is all about cracks, right? Crack initiation and crack propagation. The accumulation of cracks until something breaks apart. Wear, on the other hand here, um, usually generates these little pits. Um, it can also have some scuff marks and that kind of thing. But mostly this is due to contact stress. Uh, two pieces of metal that are pushed up against each other. Okay, yeah, they might have oil in between, but um, that repeated uh, uh, stress uh, that's due to that uh, right there on the surface uh, results in like a little chunk getting spit out right out to the thing. Um, so that's a, this is also called Hertzian stress, or Hertzian stress uh, is the, the cause of this wear, right? And uh, we remember that right below the surface um, there was the maximum amount of shear was just below the surface and uh, you could think of that as something that initiates some of the cracks. It could also be oil. Once the cracks are initiated uh, right there on the surface, oil can get into that crack and help to like spit out a chunk. So there's, there's a, it's a complicated mechanism, but that's the source of it. All right, so when we're looking at gears, we're going to treat the, each individual tooth like a cantilever beam, right? So you could look at this thing, and we have the the we know that there's a, a force that's acting on there perpendicular to the um, to the surface right here, right? That, that but but it's the transmitted one that's really causing bending, right? And so we can and we can see that the stress is going to be localized, going to be maximum right there at the root at this uh, cantilever beam, right in here. Um, here's like a graph. I don't know if I need to add this kind of information in here, but this is from another 
um, book, and it was uh, kind of telling us there's a sort of range at where the uh, where, where the where a gear is uh, operated, right? And that like the uh, low speed and high load right here is where the adhesion. This is the type of wear or contact stress uh, that you get. And there's another. Uh, there's different ranges. I thought it was kind of an interesting uh, type of thing. But we have this the, uh, up here. So there's like different ranges uh, where um, you're, you're going to be safe. Like right under here is probably the more important thing. Um, so here is going to be a derivation. And it's gonna, I think it's really useful because it makes this connection between ME370 and also um, some classic formulas that we'll see and then the AGMA formulas right here. So it's important that we go through it. And so I'm going to go at, um, do it on paper here. And um, corresponding with my, uh, my, my notes. And we're going to play a little fast and loose, but not much. Uh, so we can kind of see where the source of these equations are going to be. And this is, um, I think, a really useful uh, thing to do. So here we go. This is the, called a Lewis equation right here. And there's a lot of different interesting things inside it. First off, we have this guy right here. And that's going to be the dynamic factor. OK, so we're going to set him to the side for a little bit, uh, the dynamic factor kV. And uh, the idea here is that the speed at which a load is applied will affect what the bending stress is. If it's a, if, if it's if the gears running really slowly, it's not the same kind of stress that's going to be encountered if it's going really fast. So there's some like impacts and that kind of thing that are kind of like accounted for here. Um, so let's put him over to the side. We have this WT. This is the load that remember, and it's only the transmitted load right here. We can also think it's the tangential load. P is the diametral pitch. So this looks kind of weird to put it right there. But we'll see why it's there in a bit. F, now this is probably the most aggravating thing. F is not a force. Some genius decided that's going to be the width of the tooth, right? So that's going to be the, the thickness of the tooth. This thickness right here is F. Don't know why. And then this guy right here, this is called a form factor, this Y um, that's in there. So let's explore how this is bending stress, right? Because we know bending stress is actually MC over I. So who came up with this thing? Well, I guess I'm going to guess. Am I guessing? Lewis. And when John Stewart sees Lewis Black on um, the, the, the Comedy Central, The Daily Show there, he would always go, Lewis! So every time I see Lewis, I think of Lewis Black. Um, so Lewis Black, right here. Um, OK, so we have MC over I. And we want to try to figure out how could that possibly be bending stress. Well, let's take a, a model of this tooth as if it's just this rang, rectangular prism where it's got a depth right here of F, right here. And its, it's cross section is, OK, so its cross section is really going to be, uh, you know, if looking down here, F this way and T that way going across, right? So that's the, the two thickness right here. And it's got the length of L. Let's call it L is going to be the length. So this is a cantilever beam. And so the moment that's being placed onto this right here, right, the reaction moment is just the transmitted load times the length right there. OK, we're good with that. Now, the cross-sectional property, I, remember that's BH cubed over 12 because it's a rectangle. But it's bending across that is the neutral axis right there that we're seeing. Um, so. Um, the, the base on this is F, right? And the height is T, right? So it's going to be F T cubed over 12. And then remember C is the just one half of the, the height of the thing, or T over 2, right there. OK, so let's start placing some of those things in here for the MC over I. We have WT times L. Um, we could bring the C down to the bottom right here. Uh, I did. I didn't do that. I missed up. Okay. Um, let me. Let me. It just makes me feel more comfortable doing this right here. So I'll go M, 
and then go I over C right there. So we have WT times L divided by I, which was going to be FT cubed divided by 12. All right, so but let me get rid of that 12. Let me put that 12 back up on the top. And then this is going to be the C, which is T divided by T, but then it's going to go 2 right up on there, right? So, uh, so, so this is like t divided by 2, but I'm, I'm now going to divide that by t and multiply by 2 here. Well, notice that that goes away and that becomes that squared right here, right? So what we're left with is wt l over, oops, let me take that back, wt over f, and then I'm going to put over here 6 l and divide by t squared right here okay and we're going to take that guy and we're going to look over let's let's take a little gander at him and see and see what we can make out of this so we're putting this over to the side so this is like equation a in the book if you're looking in this chapter right here um, so now we're going to recall the addendum and dedendum Right, the addendum was a right, and this was b. So the length of this whole thing right there is going to be a plus b, which you'll recall was one over p plus one point two five over p. So that means that's going to be two point two five over p, right? The diametral pitch. So we've replaced the length with this right here. And then you'll also recall tooth thickness could be defined, at least it's the maximum tooth thickness, is going to be um, the, uh, remember if you had, we had uh, the, the circular pitch was between like right here and right here, right? So the maximum tooth thickness that we could have is one half of the circular th right here because we'd have a partner that's right here. Generally, it's going to be less than that, but we're going to go ahead and use it anyway. So the tooth thickness is going to be um, the circular pitch divided by 2, which was pi over 2p. Right? No, I mean, well, that's because we divided by 2, right? But, but we had pi divided by p, but we're also going to have 2 in there, right? Okay, so now let's start going back up onto here and take a look at our, um, you know, after after that little uh, side thing to look, take a look over here. Um, let's, let's substitute in here for this L and this T and so forth right there. So we have WT over F and 6 and then we have um, 2.25 and that's getting divided by P right there but now we have divided by T squared right in here right so let's um, put him upside down in there let's put this so we're gonna have um, 2 squared right here right somewhere in here no, he's on the bottom. Two, okay, so let me put these in parentheses. Two squared and p squared, right? And divided by pi squared. Interesting. Well, we can actually, well, not the pi. I don't know why I just did that. To get rid of that and get rid of that. And what we're left with is WTP, right? WTP over F times 5.471. Now, what they decide to do is take the inverse of this right here. And let's just say this is some factor. You know, it came from pi. It came from the 6, which originated from here. The 2.25, which originated from right here. 
Um, there's also that two got in there for sort of all of this. So let's just take a look at what would we would say if we were to divide this by one right here. Let's say that one over uh, 5.471 is equal to 0.1828, right? And let's just define that as like something that is sort of, it's a miscellaneous uh, thing. Now, one of the things that we did right away that was uh, sort of um, a compromise right here is the fact that this has got, this this thing is fatter. That, you know, we're, we're, we're making a rectangle out of this thing and it's not a rectangle. So, um, it might, and so, so it's going to change depending on what the pitch that you pick is going to be. Some pitch um, will make the tooth uh, more blunty, but if you take a higher pitch, and so here's a, a higher pitch, right? This is a more pitch right here. This is more square, right? So this is more rectangular right here, where this is more tapered, where this is a lower pitch than this right here. I don't remember what size, what pitch we had right here. But you couldn't really, you can't even really see the shape of the tooth really in here as much as you can right there, right? So what this is going to be is that we declare that to be this shape factor or the Lewis form factor. Um, so uh, what we end up with is an equation that is W T P F, which is the face width Y. All right, and then of course, well, as I mentioned, we can apply this dynamic factor to it to try to say, well, and that dynamic factor is going to amplify how much uh, stress is taking place, right? And it's an experimentally determined thing. So this right here has a little bit more math built into it. It's because of the shape of the tooth um, plus all the constant. Let's take a look though at this um, at, at this form factor right here. So here's the base core of the thing. And I think I have in here, um, here's the uh, form factor, which we will see out of the um, uh, out, out of the uh, uh, book right here. Now you take a look at that form factor and you can kind of see that um, the, the form factor that we got, just based on the numbers was 0.1828. So there's some other things taking place here as we get uh, um, a larger and larger pitch. We can say that this is a bigger and bigger number um, as we go up. And I even like plotted the thing out. I plotted what th this table that we're given, this Lewis form factor out right there. But you can kind of see where it comes from. It's uh, uh, somewhat to do with the shape of the thing. Now, um, other things that we might want to take a look at before we go to an example. Is that true? We're going to take a look at the dynamic factor right here. Okay, that's that KV. And KV um, comes from experiments probably more than anything else. Um, and they're experiments that get like confirmed over time. And they're dependent on um, the pitch line velocity, really. So that, that V, that capital V in feet per minute. And they depend on the material. They, they, there's some dependence on material they found. This is, once again, experiments that were run, especially with early gears. Um, uh, and then the way in which that they were made um, seem to have some uh, amount of uh, 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 correspondence to uh, the stresses and the failures that they were finding right here. So um, we have this cast iron one um, and 600 plus V divided by 600. Is, and then, um, so if you take a look, I've plotted them out, which isn't done in the book, but it seems to me to be an interesting thing to do. And you can see the cast iron, and that's a pretty steep slope right there. So it doesn't take much. And remember that this thing is multiplier, right? So it increases the stress. So if you're going fast, on here, and so this is like the worst teeth, at least for the most part up here. You know, I guess there's some crossover right here. Um, and these are probably curve fit from experimental data. Now, uh, the next one that you see right here and the red one, um, it doesn't look much better and it's a straight line. That's gonna be this cut or milled profile, right? Um, so this is like made out of a casting. They've made a, a mold and they poured molten metal into it. 
um, cast iron, right? Uh, and then here where they've cut, and they've used a milling machine, and they've cut these teeth out right here. Um, and and uh, so, so we could see it. And then they, they found here, let's see, the, the, sh the hobbed or shaved ones, they look like it's a little bit better right here. And then we have, um, oh no, hobbed or shaped uh, profile, right? So they're taking a hobbing machine and um, they're, 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 they're pulling the thing out there. So it's different than cutting and milling. And then um, we have the shaved or ground profile. And there's a little bit more complicated with the square root of this thing, of the square root right there. And you can see that that's a pretty low thing. So these, and once again, these are all, you know, experimentally determined and probably have a scatter of data and a whole bunch of different failures to try to make this decision. Um, later on, in uh, when we go to AGMA, they have a similar dynamic factor and, but then they go with something where they use a, 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 uh, um, a variable they call quality, right? And, and depending on how machine quality they are. So I superimposed those, uh, um, those previous ones that we just got from those equations back onto this, right? So we're gonna use the graph. There's also an equation for this, but we, most of the time I encourage you to use the graph uh, to pick off of, uh, to pick data off of this. And you can see where this like historically fits in there. Um, so the example begins here, and I'm going to uh, do that in a separate video. It ends up being a kind of a long example, but I do also want to go. Let me see. I will go to the um, I'll go to our website here. Go to our Blackboard and come into uh, useful links and resources, and come down and go to gears, and I think it's gear stress, gear design. Uh, maybe okay. So we have Martin Sprocket and Boston Gear, and so um, in both of these, there's okay. So there's the websites uh, for them, uh, but they have like an engineering section. So let me open up both of those engineering sections that are in the back of. I think this is the engineering section right here. Let's see if it is. Yeah, there's the engineering section for Boston Gear, and if you go down into there, they they give you a lot of backgrounds and things. They give you an idea of the different. These are like little pitch gauges that you could probably use. Um, here's also some dimensions that you might want to come. Here's some qu equations that are useful um, as part of this. Uh, but then they also have um, some stuff to calculate gear stress, right? So here you go, um, and, and their method here. Take a look at and make a compare and contrast, right? From metallic spur gears, they're saying that we have something called, we have this W, that's the tooth load that you can have, right? Uh, along the pitch line. And notice over here, we have horsepower uh, times our uh, velocity. So I said W times V divided by 33,000. We're used to that. We're even with this equation right here, we're used to this equation as well. And have S right here, and that is the safe material stress, stress, and that we can get that from uh, this this little table right here. They don't, of course, they're not really specific with what kind of material it is. Um, just some kinds of steels right here, and and whether it's the percentage carbon, and whether it's heat treated or not or a case hardened or not, or untreated, and here's heat treated, right? So you have a couple choices. Um, so these are the safe working stress uh, that we place in there. We see we have F, um, and that is the face width. You have Y, and that's the tooth low form factor, and you'll see that it's this guy down below here. And you'll notice that they have 14 and a half uh, degree teeth and 20 degree teeth right in there. So the pressure angles, but these are number of teeth, right? So with the number, uh, with increasing number of teeth, we have uh, an increasing form factor, right? Um, and then uh, we also, we see the 600, uh, 600 over V, right? Well, just notice that we could rearrange uh, this whole thing right and solve it for s and that would be our stress right and then this this guy right here would be inverted and we can see that he would be um, uh, we, we, where, where this came from would be this right here 600 over 600 plus V right 
Um, so I think that's a, uh, a, a an interesting and insightful thing to, to check out that we've we're, we're using this the, you know in this they're selling gears today they're using a non agma uh, approach uh, with was really the Lewis form factor and they call this actually the Lewis formula with the Barth revision I don't know who Barth was but uh, apparently he did some kind of revision. It's probably up, it's probably has to do with this dynamic factor. And you can see that non-metallic gears have a different dynamic factor uh, to be involved in there. So that's the, uh, uh, the sizing of them. And you should also note that if we go to the catalog itself, um, I think it'll be right here. And we go through this and I don't know how far down I'll have to go. We will eventually see that they will have. Uh, here you go. Okay, so here is um, tables that give you the horsepower capacity for a particular RPM for a particular uh, pitch of gear. Right. So they had organized by diametral pitch, um, by pressure angle, and then the number of teeth, but then also RPM. And they can give you what the what the horsepower capacity is going to be. So that's where that comes from, though. You have to look into their engineering section, and you can see that this is this is what they've based their uh, um, the, their their horsepower loads uh, the capacity on. Um, it doesn't hurt to take a look over at Martin Sprocket. They don't just make sprockets; they make gears. But they have an engineering section. Um, I think they had an engineering section. This is actually just uh, capacities, right? So they they don't have their description. They do have like forms that you would fill out. Oh, this is for sprockets, I'm sorry. This is the part of sprockets when we dance. Um, so they, they go through a, what the sprocket selection process would be. Um, yeah, okay, so that's the sprocket engineering one, I'm sorry. Let's see. Uh, that's the sprocket. I, I would have thought that we had the other engineering section. Maybe I must have uh, misplaced it right here, so. Um, down here at the okay yeah down here at the bottom yeah here's where we got to gear standards and we start having like this engineering uh, section gear selection they give you sort of like this uh, uh, recipe to go through uh, when picking the thing out um, there they give you uh, just did they some some formulas here to figure out um, um, uh, look at those later Right here, okay, here, so here you go. Here's your, um, some determining the face width. Um, here is the same equation right in there, right? So now we have uh, whatever they're calling L uh, right in here. But you can see the similarities is the important thing, right? Here's the diametral pitch, here's the form factor, here's the face, here's uh, probably the strength as part of this. And I guess, yeah, L right here is what they're using instead of W. I just want to put it into a context in something real. This is a you know a real company that's uh, uh, selling something, and in the back here's the engineering section. And if you had uh, just covered the Agma stuff only in this chapter, you would think that this was some type of magic uh, uh, thing taking place. But it's really MC over I. That's really basically uh, what it is. MC over I is just like bending stress. Um, but just kind of in disguise. So I would encourage you when doing um, this, working with uh, this. Uh, any type of engineering thing that you would try to pick it apart and try to figure out how it relates to the first principles that you've learned. So there you go, 28 minutes worth of information and um, I need to go home. One days. Band practice. So talk to you soon.